Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. A very, very warm welcome to our CILT International webinar number eight. My name's John Harris and I'm looking after you today and I'll have the pleasure of introducing you to our panelists and our experts a little bit later. So, with no more ado, let's move on to setting the scene and sharing some insight around some work that we've been doing as CILT over the last three months. So we want to first of all say a very warm welcome to our panellists. You'll hear a little bit more about their biographies before they speak, but we have three specialists that have kindly given up their time to talk to you today. The first we're going to hear from is Mohammed Janil, who's a partner at Merck Training in Dubai. They're one of our accredited CILT providers based in the Arab Emirates. We're going to hear from Larry Tweed, who is working on some very important projects in Central Asia. And he's going to be talking about the experiences in Kazakhstan and the surrounding countries. We're also going to hear from Dr. Namali Simsoma. And Natalie, uh, Namali is going to be talking about the experience of CRT Sri Lanka, working with their training partners to keep education moving during this period of coronavirus recovery. There's also two other panelists that are going to join for the Q&A session. The first is Jan Steenberg, who looks after our International Education Standards Committee, and he is a trustee of CILT International. And last but not least, uh, we warmly welcome Tanya Barker, who's the new Director of Professional Standards and Education here in the UK and looks after the education operation from a UK perspective. So I want to share in summary form, and if anyone wants more information on this, you can get in touch with me. We've done some survey work looking at the impact of co the coronavirus um, just when it hit and just when the pandemic was uh, beginning to kind of take hold. And more recently, looking at how people are going to plan for the new normal. So we've got two maps to show the spread of coverage and right across the world, we had over 65% of our training partners came back to give us very helpful insight into how they propose to react and respond to the predicted impact of the coronavirus. If we go to the next slide, you'll see that just over 45% of partners came back to us with some very, very detailed insights. And you'll see there that there's been quite a, a presence within Africa, within Southeast Asia, within Central Asia, and also um, across in the States as well. So really good coverage. If we move on, I just want to pick up some headlines. So we asked people to tell us, you know, what are your short-term plans? How are you going to be uh, resilient? And many providers turned around and actually said that online blended learning, looking at being quite super flexible was how they were going to, to cope with this. But equally, there was a challenge where face-to-face -face classroom teaching was really the only way that it could be delivered. And you'll see the bottom there, suspension of all classes and learning. You know, 54% of providers did consider that. If we look on the right hand side of the screen, you'll notice the variety of training products that were being run at that time. What we've seen is a massive shift now, more towards bite-sized modular learning and flexible learning rather than conventional qualifications. If we go to the next slide, there's a little bit more insight around this, where we've asked people to consider what they would need to do to move to being a virtual learning center and the kind of help that they would need from CILT centrally, but also the different styles of learning, making sure their tutors were kind of alive and vibrant and able to communicate really well um, over a screen, but also making sure that the learning and development that the students were doing outside of that experience was meaningful to them. An important consideration was around assessment, and this is a challenge that has faced uh, CILT globally, um, Tanya may well want to comment on this when we get to our, our question and answer session, but moving towards a more flexible assessment approach where 
we are not just looking at how people perform in an exam, but also their lifelong experiences, doing regular check-ins, whether that's assignment, a workplace project, or other ways of assessing their knowledge and competence. We've seen a massive shift around what that could look like. Uh, and you can see that more recently, people are planning for a much more blended uh, way of assessment and a blended way of gauging people's performance. This is probably the critical slide because what it's telling us is how people will see training delivery after COVID-19 or within the new normal. And you can see that there's a key emphasis here around the online, around blended, uh, distance learning will, will feature extremely heavily and a reduction in formal classroom, more rigid attendances. And that also will have a change on the dynamic of the type of customer that we will attract, whether that's someone that's a professional looking to validate their experience, or whether it's someone uh, wanting just to grab some bite-sized continuing professional development. So we have to be quite swift and agile, and we have to be really flexible in how we support our training providers and our CILT country organisations. So if you want more information on our insight work, um, there are two summary reports that are available um, for CILT members to look at. And I would simply ask that you just email me there at john.harris at ciltinternational.org. Now, hopefully that has helped set the scene on how resilient and robust some of our training partners are already being in making sure that human capital is center stage as part of this recovery process. So what I want to do now is to move on to our first speaker. And I've asked Mohammed Jamil uh, to consider looking back at what's happened in the Middle East, but also a little bit of a look forward as well. And while Mohammed gets ready, just a little bit about him. He's a partner with Merck Training, has a Bachelor of Science and a Master's from the American University of Beirut. He has a number of professional coaching and occupational profiling qualifications and started his career working for the Mercy Corps, an international not-for-profit organization where he collaborated with academia, government organizations and communities in the Middle East. In 2007, he joined a childhood group in the, the Middle East and North Africa region as a regional training manager, where he was instrumental in launching a dynamic executive learning program and focusing on retail training. Just before he joined Merck, he worked on a key project with Azadia Group, where he created a human capital management scheme for the group's expanding workforce in the UAE. Within Merck, Mohammed specializes in training, facilitation, and consulting within the areas of human resources leadership and management and strategic thinking. So we're absolutely delighted that Mohammed's going to kick off with his insights into the Middle East. Thanks, Mohammed. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful introduction. Okay. Uh, thank you, John, for inviting me, for inviting my company in particular to talk about learning and development in, in, in this period or in this phase. So uh, a little bit of structure about what I'm going to be talking about. I have three major pillars. The first one, I'm going to be talking about the situation of learning and development from an organizational perspective before COVID. And what I mean before COVID, what was happening or what is actually happening. Secondly, I transition about the impact of the COVID situation and how it actually accelerated the change and how organizations are behaving and how learning and development institutes are actually uh, reacting to this change or to the new demands. And in particular, I'll talk about the current challenges. I'll talk about the impact of technology on the workforce. I'll talk about what to expect from a training and development intervention. And finally, I wrap it up with a kind of a dynamic model or approach or a system that companies need to follow in order to maintain uh, and build further on the skill set of their employees. Last but not least, I'll shed the light on the Middle East, or I, have, I, ha, I will have a focus on the Middle East and how companies or organizations are behaving currently and what is expected in the near future. 
So without further ado, allow me to start. Uh, the model that the majority of organizations, uh, whether you were a corporate, private sector, public sector, or a training provider, you follow the same approach, which is the five phase or five step model. You analyze the situation, and then you go ahead and design and develop training material in accordance to, you, to this analysis, whether you are actually benchmarking in accordance to a competency gap, you target a specific performance, or actually you want to implement best practices according to international trends. And you go ahead and implement the training program and then afterwards evaluate. Now, everybody would say that this five-step model is quite effective. Why? Because it's usually based on what is needed and it's end up in the evaluation. But whenever you tend or you come to ask individuals or organizations in particular, what is the impact of this model on you? And you have several answers. The first answer would be, ah, the timeliness of the training intervention wasn't that correct. And when I mean the timeliness, I mean the length of the training intervention and the point in time where you are implementing it. In other words, you might have analyzed a situation three or four months ago, and the learning program that you have designed is no longer viable. The second point is the ability of the subject matter expert that has been recruited to deliver the training course. People would say that the instructor was good, facilitated properly, he or she possessed like a, a, a very wide area or range of skill set. Nonetheless, it might not be applicable in our industry in particular. Third, the right level of training. And usually public or private training interventions would actually gather people from different uh, professional or experienced levels. And what happens is that within the training context, you have to move within the pace of the slowest rather than the fastest. So actually participants would struggle. Last but not least, the learning methods, tools, and technology might be compliant or favorable by some, and not to mention about the functionality of what is being learned. In other words, the instructor or the company might provide a top-notch learning solution. Nonetheless, the internal processes of the companies would not permit the implementation and eventually time and money is lost. If we might say this traditional approach, I don't say it's obsolete, but it's just incomplete. Now, from a participant perspective, and the information presented is based on a survey that has been implemented or conducted by Harvard Business School, and included around 772 individuals scattered all over the world, they indicated that the training that I receive from my company is not aligned to my skill set or skill gap. In other words, the intervention might include many things and none of the things that are a priority for me to be able to crack or to do a beautiful job. The second point is that I haven't been assessed properly by neither my manager, my company, or the provider before doing or designing the training intervention. Last but not least, which is the point that is important, they cannot apply what they have learned in the real life or when they get back to it. So very much similar, the concerns are very much similar from the previous slide. Okay, this was before COVID. And then COVID hit. And all of a sudden, the organizations have chosen, if I might say, two different scenarios to adopt. The first one is that they sit down and wait, hoping that the economy would one day unpause. And if the economy would unpause, they would definitely continue to do what they have been doing. And in the meantime, they recommend some training interventions for their employees just to fill up their time in case they didn't have anything to do. The second or the second kind of organizations, they adopted a different scenario. And this scenario would focus on planning and strategy development with emphasis on efficiency and effectiveness when it comes to operations and individuals. And of course, whenever we talk about efficiency and effectiveness, one thing would come into our mind, which is the use of technology. And all of a sudden, a very important question would come into focus. What is the impact of the use of technology on workforce. How do I need to skill or reskill? Will I let my employees go? Will I let them stay? What shall I do? And this question actually is not new. McKinsey thought about it back in 2018 and they developed and published a study that actually pro projected the need for the new skill sets 
across five major industries, including energy and mining, healthcare, manufacturing, retail, etc. And they have indicated, and I, and I cite three main skill sets or competencies that might be required or are required currently. The first one is what we call higher cognitive skills. The second is social and emotional skills. And the third is technological skills. While technological skills or the need for that is quite uh, straightforward, the social and emotional skills inside the working environment are needed because currently we have three different generations operating in organizations. We talk about Generation Y, Generation X, and probably baby boomers. And those three needs to communicate. While the baby boomers, they come with the experience related to the products or services of the company, the next or the other generations comes with the tools and technologies and ability to use them in a swift and intelligent manner. So everybody needs to communicate with everybody. But what about the higher cognitive skills? What does it mean? And I'll give an example over here. If you're a sales manager operating for a specific company existing somewhere, the first or previously, what you needed to do is visit your client, go ahead and uh, uh, develop a kind of a sales strategy or a sales plan, close the sales deal, and pass it on to different departments. Today's situation is quite different. If you, say, if you are a sales manager in a particular company, you need to be able to analyze differently, to be creative, to cooperate with other departments internally and other stakeholders externally to be able to reach or hit your target. In other words, you need to communicate with the marketing department about how to penetrate a specific area or a location. The second thing that you need to do is you need to coordinate closely with the supply chain unit in your company in order to monitor the availability of stock. You need to coordinate activities with the finance department, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this is what is meant by a higher cognitive skills. I'm not saying that this person would eliminate the role of others, but he or she need to acquire some particular skills in order to speed up the time to analyze or probably take decisions. From a more of a concrete manner and using the language of learning and development, what does it mean? We need to start with the end in mind. And what do we mean by the end in mind is that we need to start by the objective. So if the objective was to increase the percentage of sales of a specific product in a specific locality, this means that this person needs to be able to analyze, interpret data coming from an artificial intelligence system, for example, advise opera operations, contribute to development of the commercial channels for product acts, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if you get to reflect or project those on training courses, and then this will be a training course in marketing, training course in finance, training course in business analytics, etc. So this is, is this possible? No, it's not possible. And this is what will push organizations to think differently when it comes to learning and development. And I present this model in particular. And then, although this model is compromised from four independent parts, yet the four of those are directly related or correlated. And one doesn't eliminate the need of the other, and one doesn't need to come before the other. It is very much situation. But let's start with the first pillar. The first one is exposure. You need to expose your employees and involve them no matter where they operated inside your organization. If you're developing scenarios about how the future would unfold, developing specific strategy, or identifying the skill gap, or identifying the training or development needs that needs to be put in place to achieve this strategy in accordance with the developed scenario, you need to involve people first. They are the best to know about what they lack. The second, when it comes to the working environment, you need to provide access to information and push your providers or management information system providers to integrate systems so that everybody sees the information or the data coming from everywhere. I'm talking about internally inside the company. The third, which is very important, is built on the experience of people by doing that. It is encouraged that companies or organization would form a kind of what we call cross-functional teams. And those teams should be responsible for developing simulations about how to lead their businesses and how to create more efficiency and effectiveness in what they do. And it would be best if they involve stakeholders. And I'm not talking about internal stakeholders, but external st stakeholders as well. Last but not least, education. And when it comes to education, we urge companies 
to do one of the following or the all combined. The first one is to decrease the reliance on external providers. And if they do, an external provider always needs to build on the tacit knowledge that exists inside organizations. And what do we mean by tacit knowledge? It means the knowledge that exists within the people inside the organization. So if you want to develop a module related to finance, you need to go to God and talk to the financial people. They are the people that are best or know or knowledgeable about what's happening inside and what is their needs in particular. Adopt a push and a pull approach. What does it mean? The push approach is that when you design an intervention and you think that everybody needs to know or everybody should be trained on that. But nonetheless, open the arena or the space for employees to ask for what they want. Last but not least, focus. Focus. The training interventions, as we know, the certified programs that would be extending over a period of three or five days and all inclusive might not be that efficient or cost effective. We are advising and amending our processes or products actually to focus to deliver, as you mentioned, John, before, bite-sized learning interventions in according to the needs of companies and individuals operating in those. Last but not least, I want to talk about what's happening in the Middle East in particular. I want to go back in time in the 1900s, 2000, and 2010s, if I might say, from an organizational and individual perspective. For organizations back in the 1990s, they looked at training interventions as a kind of motivators, a retention tool or a retention methodology to retain individuals, especially locals. Why I'm specifying this? Because in the GCC and not Middle East, GCC, I'm talking about countries such as Saudi Arabia, Oman, United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, Bahrain, etc. Those countries, the governance, and the economy is being not only actually only controlled by but operated by public organizations. And those public organizations, they have a, a mandate, if I might say. In the beginning, they relied or depended on expatriates, but they have a mandate to replace all of the expatriates with local expertise or with local skills. So in the beginning, they wanted to attract the locals. So to attract them, they provided training interventions. And then they requested those locals or the nationals to do some performance improvements and currently they're asking them to transfer transform public organizations to be able to cope with the strategies that are developed by those countries in particular from an individual perspective in the beginning they looked at training and development as a reward mean and they took it then they took it uh, as a, a tool so that they can progress with their career because they need to fulfill one, two, three, four training interventions before being able to go up the, up the uh, career ladder. Last but not least, starting 2010 on onwards, they are going to training courses to be able to stay fit and maintain their positions. This being said, there are several things that needs to be taken into consideration by organizations, no matter what they do, in the Middle East in particular, to be able to skill and reskill their individuals. The first one is to be, or to adopt digital solutions. So what do I mean digital solution? I'm not talking about e-commerce, no. I mean the provision of platforms that would ensure the channeling of proper information, whether from internal or external resources for people to be able to take decisions and act. The second, create synergies. And I cite an example over here. The government of Saudi Arabia did create a partnership in the beginning with McKinsey to develop their strategy 2030, but this is not the important one. The important one is another uh, a partnership with Deloitte in order to establish a digital information center. And this digital information center is to provide information for the public organization, private organizations, and provide training courses for individuals that need to improve their skills. So synergies are quite important over here. And it's no longer that I call a training provider and ask him or ask them to provide a training course under this particular title. No, they need to come, assess what's happening in my organization, have a look at my strategy and create something in accordance to my performance indicator. Everybody is accountable today. Third, use data analytics and provide data or information, and not only train people on how to interpret data, but encourage them to develop, as previously mentioned, simulations using leading and lagging indicators. Before I end, focus on the core. 
Now, I use the example of the sales manager. If you're a sales manager and you need to understand finance, stock, logistics, etc., it doesn't mean that you need to let go of your actual competency, which is sales. No, on the contrary, you need to develop it. Last but not least, and this is very much for private organizations, focus first on creating operational resilience. Whether it's related to how to teach your leaders or managers, how to manage from a distance, use technology, use different channels to keep, uh, I don't say af afloat the company afloat, but at least maintain connection with your clients at all times until the situation changes and economy started to improve a little bit. Okay, thank you very much, Mohammed, for a very, very informative session. Uh, that was absolutely great. Um, I have got a couple of questions for you, but I'm going to hold them back till the panel at the end. Um, so I'm going to now ask Larry Tweed just to uh, get, just to give everyone a little bit of insight um, about Larry. Uh, Larry um, is actually um, a partner working with us in the Central Asia region at the moment. So we have a, a live project working with him. Um, by background, he's uh, an international development consultant with over 13 years of experience leading teams in Africa and Asia. In 2014, he led one of Africa's largest ever pilot projects in Nigeria, and that utilized digital wallets and a network of 250 staff to help nearly half a million farmers to buy subsidized seeds and fertilizers. So a real achievement there. He lives in Kazakhstan at the moment, where he serves as a market systems advisor on the USAID Competitiveness, Trade and Jobs project in Central Asia. That's CTJ for short. And you'll hear Larry talking about that in his presentation. Now, one of the things that CTJ has to do is increase competitiveness of transport and logistics companies in Central Asia. And uh, he will tell you a little bit more about our partnership to invest in people's potential through professional development. Uh, some other facts about him is he actually trained in philosophy and got a law degree and uh, worked in, as an attorney in Minnesota before volunteering, volunteering for the Peace Corps in Kyrgyzstan um, in 2004. Uh, Larry is a really, really flexible guy and believes that humans' ability to continuously adapt and learn is among our greatest traits. So thank you so much Larry, for giving up your time, and over to you. Great, thanks, John. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so we're talking about transportation and logistics today. Um, so I thought it was only appropriate that I give you a little bit of a roadmap of this discussion. I'm, I'm gonna begin by telling you a little bit about my first encounter with CILT, and then move on to talking briefly about some transportation logistics challenges in Central Asia. I um, want to provide you with a, uh, a short overview of our CTJ project and our market systems approach. I think that that's um, both important and uh, significant in terms of our collaboration with um, CILT. And then um, I want to talk uh, about our response to the pandemic. And when I say our, I mean the project and CILT because this has been a truly collaborative effort. And then finally, um, I want to answer the question, why should we continue to invest in human capital? So my first collaboration with CILT um, began in 2018, and it was literally in the middle of nowhere. We were 80 miles from the Eurasian pole of inaccessibility. Uh, for those of you that aren't cartographers, this is the point on Earth that is furthest from any port in the entire world. Um, it was there that I met John Harris uh, and Keith Newton. They were eating Chinese food in a town called Korgos, um, and uh, that's on the Chinese-Kazakhstan border. I figured if these two British guys could find their way to a Chinese restaurant in the middle of nowhere, they must know something about transportation and logistics. It was, it was really good timing. It was quite fortuitous. It, this was 2018 and the World Bank's uh, Logistics Performance Index had just confirmed that um, one of the greatest constraints was the logistics 
the logistics sector's gap in skills and that this was dragging down uh, or preventing growth in a lot of the developing countries. These were findings that were also supported by my colleague Aijan and the Transportation and Logistics Partnership here in Central Asia, who had interviewed dozens of companies and uh, identified a lack of skills as a key constraint to, uh, to growth in the, in the transport and logistics sector. So, you know, even under normal times, um, transportation and logistics is uh, extremely challenging. It's, it's a field that is inherently complex, um, it's a volume business, it's extremely competitive, the margins are quite thin, and it's, it's constantly in flux. I mean, uh, a, along with new technology, it's in flux in other ways where, you know, the changing fuel prices, weather patterns, just changes in supply and demand. So any skills gap is immediately going to put a company at a competitive disadvantage. Now, all of these issues and challenges are amplified in Central Asia for, for a number of reasons. I'm gonna go over just a, a few of them. First of all, all of the countries that we work in are entirely landlocked. And Uzbekistan is one of only two countries in the entire world that is doubly landlocked. It, we're, we're working in an environment that involves vast distances. Kazakhstan itself is the ninth largest country in terms of land mass. And we've got Russia, number one, to the north and, and China uh, to the east. It's very difficult terrain. It's extremely mountainous. There's different work cultures, um, not only between the different stands themselves, but also uh, between Central Asia and Russia or Central Asia and Europe or China. And there's a lot of geopolitical um, chess games going on in this region. We've got great, we're surrounded by these great powers and um, everybody's vying for interest. And this is sort of the thoroughfare um, from east to west. So if that hasn't given you kind of an image of um, some of the challenges, I've got a short video, very short. Um, this was taken about two weeks ago. So incidentally, that video was taken on the border of Kazakhstan and China. Um, that queue or convoy of trucks is about 30 kilometers long, and it was taking drivers at the end of the queue between four to six days to get to the border and be able to cross from Kazakhstan into China in order to pick up goods and then hopefully bring them back home. Um, this gives you, I hope, a little bit of uh, an idea as to why uh, a United States um, Agency for International Development project might be um, working in the region. So as John, as John mentioned, um, we are the Competitiveness, Trade, and Jobs Project. We're primarily focused on um, facilitating trade between Central Asian countries and the rest of the world. It's a five-year project and it's regional in nature. We're not just working in Kazakhstan. We work here in Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and Turkmenistan. We're working across three, three sectors, horticulture, tourism, and transport and logistics. And I've, um, I've emphasized transport and logistics because it's the, it's the only one of the three that also involves the other two. Um, and we're, we're taking a, a market systems approach to, this, uh, to the work that we're doing in this region. And I'll, I'll talk a little, bit about, a little bit more about what that means. So in traditional development uh, approaches, um, there's a tendency to focus on the, the problems that are the most visible. And a lot of times these are kind of the, the main gaps in supply and demand. If, it, if it's an agricultural project, a lot of times we're looking at uh, maybe the supply of fertilizer and seed and other inputs to farmers. In, in, in our case here in, uh, in Central Asia and in the transport and logistics sector, um, as, I, as I mentioned, the, um, uh, the World Bank has identified a major gap in the, uh, in the skills. Um, now, a, a market systems approach is not only going to look at the kind of the core gap in supply and demand, but it's going to look at some of the underlying causes and the systemic constraints. So if you think of the core as supply and demand in a market systems approach, 
we're also going to be looking at relationships between supporting functions, and those may be banks, educational institutions, associations, um, service providers, as well as um, kind of government and regulations, both um, uh, traditional uh, rules and informal rules. In a traditional approach, it's often more direct. We, uh, the, the project will identify the problem and then they'll, they'll seek a solution. And a lot of times um, that means if, if, it's, if it's training needs, they'll go out to the international market, identify experts, bring them into the country, do a, conduct a training. Those experts will go home and hopefully the idea is that the employees are, are then trained. In a, in a market systems approach, um, our, our focus is a little bit more what, what we call facilitative. We're, we're constantly building relationships and we're trying to make um, connections and market linkages. Our, our solutions tend to be delivered more by local service providers. And if those local service providers are lacking the, the capacity or ability to deliver those trainings, then we'll try and build their skills so that they can deliver those trainings to the workforce. Traditional approaches um, are a little bit more rigid in their construction, while uh, market systems approaches are more agile or adaptive. If something is working well, we can kind of double down on it. And if something's not working, um, we can pivot and try something new. These traditional approaches play a little bit shorter game. It's, it's more focused on the immediate needs, while as market system approaches um, are focused on longer term behavior change. Um, and aligning kind of the, the incentives with the, the market, the longer term market objectives. So there's, there's also a lot of unintended consequences in the traditional approach. Because the project takes more of a direct role and kind of plays, uh, plays the role of the market actor, sometimes this can distort market prices. So if we're talking about agricultural inputs, if it's the project that's buying them and distributing to the farmers, then we're actually distorting the market prices in the local markets. Um, if it's trainings and we're bringing in only international experts, then we may be crowding out the local service providers that, that could be um, conducting those trainings. It also has a tendency to perpetuate uh, dependency on foreign aid. So if everything is being delivered and it's free, um, you're kind of creating this mindset that why should I pay for these services when an international donor is going to be providing these for free. Um, in a traditional approach, sustainability may be a little bit more of an afterthought. People may talk about it a lot, but in, in reality, um, it's, it's not the most important thing. Whereas in, in our approach, we're really trying to focus on long-term sustainability and being able to deliver um, trainings well beyond the, life, uh, the lifeline or lifetime of this project. So next, I, I would like to transition into how did CTJ and CILT respond to the global pandemic? Um, love the CILT tagline, Stronger Together, um, a firm believer in collaboration. So, um, you know, when uh, in, in early March, when we started to get a notion that this could be an extremely disruptive pandemic, this was even shortly before WHO announced and called it a global pandemic. We were collaborating with CILT, kind of had our, our fingers on the pulse of what might be happening and started asking questions. Um, we assessed the situation and we, we tried to anticipate uh, what the needs would be if this was going to impact Central Asia. That seems so far uh, like a lifetime ago, but this was just four months ago. Um, this was before the first case here in Central Asia was even identified. We reprioritized and refocused a lot of our energy um, on medium, uh, small and medium-sized enterprises. We realized that the larger firms normally have a little bit more cash flow and capital on hand and would probably be a little bit more able to weather the storm. We moved from analog to digital, and by that I mean we had, we had originally planned on conducting um, a series of trainings in person, having uh, folks travel to a training center, and obviously that's not really possible. So we quickly said, what, what sort of platforms are out there for trainings? Um, we're all familiar with Zoom now, but at that time we weren't even uh, sure which webinar platform might be the best to use in the region. 
So um, that was that was part of our, our thought process. And we expanded access to relevant content. CILT has a great repository of, um, of content and information. We went in and looked at what might be the most important, what can we deliver right now? So business continuity planning, um, um, crisis management, um, those items were immediately translated, as well as CILT's uh, timely bulletin, which was grabbing information from around the world. We were able to quickly convert that into local language, which is Russian, and get that information out. Um, we also, both as a project and CLT, we encouraged experimentation. We realized that these are uncertain times um, and that not all of our approaches are gonna work. It's not all gonna stick, um, but we, we, want, we wanted people to feel confident and comfortable in trying out new things to try and learn what, what would work. Now, we're already on to my last slide, um, and we want to try and answer the question why it's important to invest in, in human capital during a global pandemic. I, yeah, I think the first and most obvious thing is coordination and safety. When, when you bring people together um, from an organization into a training, and if it's in person or online, um, you're, you're providing them with a coordinated approach, and you're making sure that everybody is on the same page. And that's extremely important. During, during these times when safety is the number one priority and just understanding what the most current information is, um, is extremely important. Investing in human capital also generates value and not just from the business perspective. Obviously, when your business units are operating with maximum efficiency, it's gonna elevate and raise the value of your entire organization. And it's one of the reasons why private equity firms actually look at the human capital element when they're, they're making a bid for a, for a new company. But it also raises the, the value of the individual. Um, there's plenty of studies out there that show uh, that when, a, when an individual workforce um, understands what their roles and responsibilities are and they know how to work at a high level, um, that, that their self-worth uh, also, also increases. Now, again, when, you're, when your organization is firing on all cylinders, when your operations unit is maximizing their efficiency, your marketing team is going out and finding new business, your customer service team is retaining your current customers um, and helping you stand out from the pack, um, this, really, this really helps uh, you, know, you compete. A trained workforce, um, and, and, and Mohammed, thank you, you were actually saying this as well, a trained workforce is going to increase your agility. I mean, when, when, you can, when you can solve on the fly, when you're scenario planning and um, you, you've, gone over, you've gone over what could go wrong and you've gotten your team thinking about these things ahead of time, they're going to be more able to respond with, with a good answer when, um, when a problem arises. Competent team allows you to distribute your decision making. When your managers can handle those day-to-day -day challenges and problems that arise, and they're not calling the CEO every time to get to get input or to make make sure they're making the right decision, um, it allows a leader to step back. Which brings me to my final point: when a leader has the time to step back, they can focus more on strategic thinking. This pandemic is not going to be the last black swan. Um, this has accelerated um, automation and AI, which are going to continue to disrupt this field. Um, the whole idea of globalizations and global supply chains uh, are, are in question right now. So there's a lot of thought that needs to go into this dynamic field and how things are going to be changing in the future. And that's it. That's the end. Um, I want to thank you guys. Okay. Thank you so much, Larry, for the insight into the Central Asia and USAID experience. We'll come back with a couple of questions for you at the end. Um, what I'd like to do now is move straight over to uh, uh, Sri Lanka and to hear from Namali. And Namali Sirisoma um, <clears throat> is currently a dean at the university, um, at uh, one of our key universities in Sri Lanka. Her background is uh, in BSc Engineering, and she has a, 
a wide career doing things in Canada. She's worked at the University of Hong Kong and latterly working with in the aviation sector uh, in Sri Lanka. She's trained as a chartered civil engineer and is member of a number of professional bodies and has worked on many government consultancy teams um, in the country. She's been awarded with a number of merits and professional recognitions for her achievements within transport planning and engineering. And her current role is as the Dean looking after the logistics and supply chain courses at the General Sir John Kotiwala Defence University in Sri Lanka. Over to you, Namali. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you for inviting me for this presentation. I will share some of the uh, Sri Lankan experience in uh, education and learning during this uh, COVID pandemic. So if we take Sri Lanka education system, we have two types. First, we have the school education, where we have primary and secondary school levels. And then after we finishing the school, they can start tertiary or university level education. So there are three main examinations done by the government. So those are all island examinations. Everybody is sitting the same exam. That is in year five scholarship exams. So when they uh, complete it, they can, students can go for a better school. Then we have a year 11 general certification of education examination. That is, that will give the entry qualification for the advanced level. So then after two years, they will sit for the general certificate of education advanced level examination, which will give the entry criteria for the university entrance. So uh, two examinations are normally held in August. So we have to postpone all these things now. At the moment, they have uh, scheduled that in October. So the examination normally, which we have in December, still uh, they think that they will be able to do it in December. So if we take the university structure, so we have 15 state universities under Ministry of Higher Education. So for these students, they can follow all their university education free of charge. So therefore the entrance is very competitive. Normally after this advanced level examination, 10 to 20% of the students get this opportunity. Then we have another group, again state universities, but under different ministries. So if we take even my university, Kotalawala Defense University, so we are under Ministry of Defense. But we have two categories, officer cadets and uh, the civil students. Officer cadets, they give, we give free uh, education, but the others, they have to pay. Then in addition, we have this private university sector. So they are mostly affiliated to foreign universities in other countries. So if we take CIRT training partners, we have training partners in all these groups. So uh, all these groups were affected with the COVID pandemic. Normally we got the first uh, warning somewhere in February, but the government decided to uh, close all the education institutes around uh, 15th March. Then few days later, then there were several reported cases. Therefore the entire country was locked down. Uh, so uh, even nobody was allowed to go out for any work. Military took over the entire uh, controlling of logistics and then uh, disinfection and everything. Of course, Sri Lanka military is very, very strong in disaster management. They are well trained and they know how to handle this different situation well. So strict guidelines were given to public when they appear in uh, uh, public places, shopping malls, supermarkets, etc. That is why we control the number of infected cases in a very low level. So the education sector, after like uh, two, two weeks of lockdown, so then all the universities were asked to uh, start this online lecturing. But this was a sudden decision because earlier we, we, we were not practicing this online teaching except these private universities with affiliation with the foreign universities, but all the others, so they have to start it 
uh, as a new new approach so therefore there were many uh, technical issues restrictions especially those who are in the rural area so they they don't have proper internet and then some of the students of course they don't have any laptops because some courses uh, they don't need uh, use of any laptops in their courses and then even the lecturers so the, they are doing mainly the classroom teaching so their it skills were poor so uh, the then we had to look into these aspects and how to overcome these in a shorter period and the biggest constraint was like nobody was allowed to go out even to buy a new laptop or, or to get a new uh, internet connection it was not allowed so uh, many many discussions were taken place how to overcome this and then provide these facilities to others so this was our normal situation very close interactions discussions and teachers and students were very close but within one or two weeks all of or everybody was asked to go on distance learning so this was a challenge for both student and the lecturer so in general in sri lanka data was expensive so it's like uh, normally we use data for telephone calls and then social media and all those stuff but uh mainly it's if you compare the cost of other telephone calls and other expenses data is a bit expensive so this was a main concern uh, in the government sector and even in the school sector so when they start doing online teaching so who is going to pay these internet bills so it it was not affordable for some of the students uh, in the country so therefore government had to intervene so what they did was like they developed this network facility we call it learn through lanka education and research network and registered all the uh, state universities into this learn system so when the students got registered in that so their internet connections was free so that students were given the facility to connect easily and start their education all the cit education providers which who are under the state universities uh, they got this facility so then they had they got the access to uh, online teaching uh, at a very low cost then the, the schools, the, then the service providers, so the, the communication service providers, they came up with some new packages for schools and teachers, etc. And so that uh, so the, the student could start their uh, online teaching or online learning process at a low cost. So they gave all these facilities through Zoom, Office 365 and Teams, etc. So then uh, we were able to manage this, uh, the issue of uh, getting data for these students, but still in rural areas. So there are maybe people who don't have this data, but there are the advantages since rural areas, their classrooms are smaller, so they can bring the students uh, to the classrooms under these health guidelines. But in the urban sector, since the numbers are large, so it is a bit difficult to have classroom activities as uh, before the COVID period. Then uh, under these University Grants Commission, so there's a special committee called uh, Committee for Vice Chancellors and Directors, we call it CVCD. So they take decisions uh, on academic and administration matters for all the state universities. So these people were meeting uh, so many times uh, often, and then there's a separate presidential task force to control this COVID. There we have all the uh, military officers and then the health sector, uh, high authorities, and then the government sector authorities, etc. So, so many discussions are happening often and then they issue instructions to public time to time. 
So the universities were closed for about three months. So then all the DCLT uh, training providers, so they had to do all these online teaching during that time. So nobody was allowed to access or uh, come to their educational centers. So we started all these places on 15th May, but only for staff, still students were not allowed to come. And then uh, we, in, in individual institutional level, so we had to make plans uh, on our future work, how to start it, but under very strict uh, instructions given by the health ministry. So uh, there are very strict regulations, especially on usage of hostels, cafeteria, then common areas, uh, etc. So, so the authorities, so they had the freedom to take decisions how to plan these uh, academic work. So what we did was we planned to start the examinations first because there were there are final year students. And there are students who have all, almost completed their semester uh, lecture, so they are supposed to sit for the exams or then uh, start these internships, etc. So therefore, examinations were planned, uh, started with the most senior intake, and then uh, so even in the examination halls earlier, we were used to have one meter distance, but now. We kept one and a half meter distance and then uh, conducted examinations under this, uh, the, the restrictions and instructions given by the health ministry. So once the final year was done, then the, the next senior batch was taken. Likewise, the, the examinations were conducted. So, uh, but all the time, so every institute, so they have a COVID control task force. Even in my university, there's a separate task force to look after all these issues because even here we had one incident. Uh, so two students came to their examinations and they had high temperature. We didn't know the reasons for that. Then quickly, uh, we have an ambulance here in our university, we send them for PCR testing, but later on we found out it's not uh, COVID-19, but it is due to some viral fever. So, but we are always ready to handle these situations. So doctors and uh, all these COVID control task force, so they are, uh, they, they are responsible in handling these uh, emergency situations. Still, of course, in Sri Lanka, there, there are no reported single university student but, but we found two school kids uh, infected with COVID-19 like two weeks back. So the other other lecture uh, other than the examinations all the lectures are done through the Zoom and uh, Teams and Google Classroom etc. Lecturers have the freedom to do that and again, if they need any assistance, so the other institutes are uh, ready to help them, even all our CRT education providers. So they continue all their uh, education programs online. And all the students, so they are supposed to wear a mask, even not only the students, everybody, it's a mask in Sri Lanka. And at the entrance, we check the temperature uh, every day and they have to wash their hands and then we, they should have a sanitizer with them. So those are very uh, so strictly uh, looked after and then ensure that they follow the, the same uh, health instructions. But the challenges are like during this period when all of a sudden, when we change from classroom to online, so then uh, we need some paradigm shift there. So the, the lecturers, of course, when we teach, always it goes with caring, love, interactions. So there are so many emotional factors that we, we need to uh, look into. But all of a sudden, when you don't see your students, you miss them. 
and it can demotivate a lecturer to do, do their teaching properly. So therefore, we, we, what we prepared a method so that rather than doing like three hours or two hours uh, lecture continuously, so they had to teach only half an hour. After that, they give two or uh, three questions so that the students have to answer, then go with an interactive session. So all the, the lengthy lectures, so we uh, divided into short half an hour sessions so that that encourage the, the student lecturer uh, interactions. Of course, our prime target is to save all those students from this COVID-19 infection. And of course, we have to mentally prepare these students for the examinations because some students, so they have the fear of uh, getting these uh, COVID-19 infected. So they are scared to come. So we need some uh, mentoring and counseling. So all these things are done. So there are online counseling programs available. So the contact details of uh, counselors are given to students so they can talk to them and then we make them uh, prepared for the examinations and try to finish uh, these all their degree programs as per the calendar. Hi, now. Hi, now, Emily. Um, it's just yeah. a minute or so to go. So if you want to move to the recommendations, that would be great. Okay, okay. So uh, so we are right ready with this new... One challenge we have is like students can uh, say like uh, misuse this technology and we don't know whether they have proper learning uh, environment at home and they can use some other things during the lectures. So therefore, so when we give the, so what we need to uh, uh, consider is like in the future, so we have to ensure the quality of the education because if we take the learning pyramid, the theory will be in the, the peak only. But we have to ensure that the students get the knowledge and they get the hands-on experience as well. So we have to convert this education into activity-based education. And our examination systems now, we have to go from closed book to open book examinations. So we have to train our lecturers. We have to train our students on these new, uh, new methodologies. But even if we go for closed book examinations, we have to use uh, artificial intelligence and see whether we can uh, apply all these new technologies in our education system because this should be continued throughout uh, and then uh, we have to come up with new systems so ensuring the quality of the education and we give the knowledge and the skills to students so therefore we need some policy making and then preparation of curriculum with the with this new new normal so that's a challenge in the system. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much, Namali. Thank you for okay. taking us on that whistle stop tour of the practical things that you have done at your university and also the efforts that CLT Sri Lanka have made. Now, we're going to go into a, a short panel time. I'm glad to say we've got a couple of questions that have come in already. I will come to those in a minute but I guess I wanted to uh, go back to the beginning uh, and I'm going to ask Mohammed a question and then I'm going to ask um, Tanya if um, she would like to, to give a view as well. Um, this is to do with the training market and we've heard a lot about adaptability so my question for Mohammed uh, for the Middle East is Mohammed, what do you think the biggest challenge will be for the training markets over the next year? Budget. Yeah. Budget. Um, I tell you, for the past three years, Merck, as Merck, uh, we trained over 1,300 uh, individuals or professionals in topics related to uh, transportation and logistics. 99% of those came from the public sector. 
and currently the public sector spending it's frozen because of the economical situation they have other priorities etc so from now until the near future if i might say if everything went back to normal and opened up there will be lots of restriction when it comes to public spending this would push us and other providers as well to provide a kind of a virtual um, uh, uh, solutions that vary in time, face-to-face, -face, synchronous or asynchronous, etc. This is one of the major challenges. The second challenge over here is the trust. I, mean, I will not take much, I'll wrap, it, I'll wrap it over here. If you can see over LinkedIn, there is a boom of individuals, small companies, etc. They're trying to promote or provide a, a specific knowledge for free in order to connect with the clients at this stage. Now, this is an advantage and disadvantage. It's an advantage for small providers because they have access to big companies today or individuals. And it is a disadvantage because you cannot maintain the quality of the knowledge or information shared from those individuals or companies to the uh, organizations after learning interventions. Okay. Thank you, Mohammed. Two insights there, trust and budget. Tanya, from a UK perspective or from your your wider experience in, in working globally, what's your view on that question? I think um, one of the biggest tra challenges really is, one of them has been mentioned in some of the questions, accessibility, I think, to learning, both from a technology standpoint, but also from um, being able to know what's out there uh, and to reflect on what Mohammed said, those learning interventions to be right for, for the need at that time. Because I think there are a lot of um, qualifications or courses or learning solutions that are out there already, but they've already been predefined by the people that supply them. And I think there needs to be a really big push on those organisations understanding what it is that they need for their employees or potential employees to have in terms of identifying skills gaps and then being able to go and get bespoke learning from an organization at a really cost effective price and not having bespoke learning being this a really expensive um, um, thing to, to obtain and i think that that's a real challenge to get the right learning solution to the right people and make it accessible Excellent, Tanya. Thank you. That's again, it's all about flexibility and around everyone else not having to fit around the trainer. It's around looking at the needs and the gaps and how to fill that. I want to pick up on that theme now with Larry, actually, because you were talking a lot about the skills in Central Asia. L Larry, a question to you, and then I'm going to ask if anyone else wants to, to chip in, is if you had a magic wand, what one barrier to uh, skills development would you like to see removed from organizations? Well, Mohammed already mentioned budget, so let me let me try and focus on something else. Um, I, th I think here we come from a history that uh, had was very competitive and sort of looked at the industry as zero sum. And so everybody was, was focused on gathering information. And um, this is kind of before the democratization of a lot of this information, the Uberization of a lot of information. But um, I, I think now if, if we could see some more collaboration and, and kind of people chipping into a common pot to bring in uh, service providers to help, to help train uh, the workforce, we may be able to get further faster. Um, skills and trainings are still expensive, uh, or at least they're viewed as expensive. Um, so part of it might also be trying to change the mindset here to show that an investment in human capital is actually going to um, provide a, a return. So I think part of it is also the framing. Okay, thank you for that, Larry. I'm going to turn to Jan now, actually, because obviously in in Jan's day job, he is actually working for a major international company that have got their own academy and their own attention to skills. Jan, what's your take on that issue? A good, good question. I think 
I mean, being part of an organization with more than 450,000 employees worldwide in 78 countries, when, when, when the world changed, we had to change, uh, change as well. And we did that very rapidly. We implemented what we called a, a safe working from home procedure, uh, which was part of our, I guess it was part of our sort of corporate um, sort of recovery plan for, for, for any disasters that, that were due to happen. And, and what was remarkable was that, uh, that all of that was done within sort of two weeks. Um, so within two weeks, we enabled 450,000 people to work from home as opposed to work in an office. Our CEO has said, said that he would expect in the future that only 25% of the workforce will be in the offices that we have around the world um, at any one point in time. He also said that he'd seen a productivity increase of about 25% during the, the pandemic, which is kind of interesting because, uh, I mean, we as an organization within sort of um, TCS or Task Consultancy Services have uh, been training people on agile, agile thinking, agile methodologies uh, for a number of years um, and, and taking people through that learning process, which of course is not necessarily something you've learned at university or or as part of your degree, but it's, it's sort of been learning that's been added on as the requirements were, were, were becoming more obvious. And I think that, that, that's an important lesson as well. I think it's very, very um, critical that we, we, we look at learning you know, on demand. We look at learning from a lifelong process. So it's also about CPD. It's, all, it's not just about sort of particular courses that we, we take. Um, and it's also about sort of uh, using technology to enable some of those uh, activities in, in learning. And we've seen that, and we are seeing that. I mean, Zoom had 10 million users in December last year. They have 300 million now. Microsoft Teams had about 12 million uh, in December last year, and they have about 75 million now. We are adopting new technology in a way and at a pace that we've never seen before. And I think that's a very important sort of consideration uh, all over the world uh, that, that we, we, we sort of consider when we talk about how to distribute knowledge and learning and learning experiences. Now, of course, I do understand why some of the large universities would like, rather see students on campus paying very large fees uh, for the programs that they run. And I'm sure that will continue uh, in the future to some extent. I, I would say as well that I think, you know, as CLT, we can compete with a lot of those sort of learning institutions out there and offer, you know, very high quality uh, learning programs on a global scale across 35 countries uh, and a member base that's continuously growing uh, and now sort of about 35,000 sort of uh, number mark on an ongoing basis and we should do that and we are doing that and i'm very proud of that i think we are making fantastic sort of strides going forward um, with, with regards to our learning offerings and, and making things modular and and try and design it for the individual rather than um here's a course and you start you know step number one and you finish at step number 250. you know no, that's not how people learn these days and that's how, not how education uh, really works at least in my opinion. Great, thanks Jan. The flexibility message around putting the learner first, a very clear message there. We've got time for three more quick questions. Um, I've got one for Namely actually. Um, Namely, you, you shared a whistle stop of what's happening in Sri Lanka. What would be the one top tip, if you had to choose just one, that would help um, other CILT uh, countries around keeping the training alive, particularly those in developing countries, what top tip would that be? Uh, well, John, the thing is like, of course, this online teaching is not a new thing in developed countries, but this is a new experience in developing countries. So now we have developed all our course outlines, curriculum and learning objectives, targeting the classroom teaching but we have to like re-look at how we can go into more activity based 
one advantage is like now we can share the resource person internationally so if they don't have enough people so we can let all these members to attend one workshop or one examination etc so clt can look into that and then uh, we have to like go into more activities and even some simulation and softwares which can buy uh, because those are expensive to buy for those countries but even CIT can share that so I think that will be a good knowledge sharing uh, initiative. Excellent thank you Namli some food for thought there for us to certainly take back um, thank you we have two questions from those online. Um, I want to ask a question to Mohammed. Uh, this question is from Edward Lau. And in short, what he is saying is we, we have digital inequality. So it picks up on Namely's point that, you know, the developing world in particular may still be catching up to some degree. Now, the question is, Mohammed, what's your observations and advice to companies who have subsidiaries and branches in developing communities and cities um, where they need human capital uh, to transform? But obviously, the, the digital and technology uh, thing is a, is a struggle. What's your view on that? Okay, if you look at training from two different perspectives, the first perspective is for me to be able to do my job as an individual working in a corporation or an organization. And then the second perspective for me to grow or to push the organization with me. I'm going to disregard the second and focus on the first. Now, there is lots of knowledge and information existing inside the companies and inside the departments of individuals and external departments that needs to be leveraged on first. Using those or formalizing those or sometimes only giving access or, to individuals or employees to information directly from those individuals can solve half of the problem or three quarters of the problem. Resorting to external means for the provision of a, a, a capacity building intervention is, is very much favorable. But most of the time, as Tanya mentioned, you uh, lose on the customization factor. So if I come to a specific organization, to talk about learning and development, to talk about a specific process. I talk from my own personal experience. And most of the time, people working in development or in training have left the corporate world since some time. So whenever I'm going to come and put on the table, it might not be that functional or applicable, if I might say. So why to fall into the strap? Start first with the information or the wealth of information that exists in the companies or in the organizations. This is one. The second. Yes, technology existed in my part of the world in particular, like Zoom, Zoom actually was blocked until recently, until the COVID, huh? but there used to be virtual communication platforms, but they're culturally unacceptable. So if you facilitate a kind of a workshop or a training intervention here in Dubai today, or in the GCC in particular, you find the majority of individuals turning their cameras off and refusing to turn it on. So which add another challenge to the communication pattern. So to sum it up, my answer or good advice would be leverage on internal resources first and spend on technology or external resources as and when needed. Okay, thank you. Um, Tanya, I'm just going to turn to you because I know that you've had experience with Nibosh as, as well before joining CILT. Um, there's certainly some cultural issues and legal issues around the use of, of online and the communication. What's your take on I guess the challenge facing CILT at the moment with uh, the move to online. <clears throat> it's a really interesting question and one that, uh, that we, um, have, it, it's been a challenge in the UK as well, because obviously um, not everybody is um, au fait with technology and there's a fear factor around technology as well. And you, you still need to have that blended approach to learning. It can't be in-person training at the moment. There's too much risk involved in that currently. So it's also looking at other ways other than just online. I know online is the buzz at the moment and that's really important, but there are other mediums that can be explored in terms of people, people being able to learn. You know, um, if you've got something in front of you that's, that's learning material and it can be as engaging as it can be in, in person or online, um, that's a paper-based learning, and then potentially you could 
um, interact with somebody um, verbally or, or on, a, on a telephone call. These are ways that we've had for many, many years, and it seems that they've almost been forgotten because online is the buzzword. And I think that that, as part of blended learning, is still really, really important and can potentially be more accessible in the developing countries than having that online um, you know, the, the cost of, of, of internet, uh, et cetera. And I think that's something that definitely needs to be maybe taken that one step further. So going back to basics, looking at our paper-based material and thinking, how do we make this more interactive and more interesting? How do we ask an individual to pose themselves a question from this material and maybe do an activity in their own safe environment that helps them to have that reflective learning experience? And I think that's something that really needs looking at to, to engage with those in developing countries or developing parts of the world where they can't access the technology. Okay, thank you, Tanya. We're gonna to go to my final question now. Time has flown by and it's for Larry from Kim Hassel in Australia. The question, Larry, we hear so little of Central Asia, which is obviously highly cultural and covers huge distances. His question is, will Belt and Road improve things and even open up several countries for international investment? Yeah, thanks, John. Without, um, without getting too political here, we're, we're already seeing significant changes in the region. Um, there's, quite a bit of, um, there, there's quite a bit of an increase in goods flowing from China through Central Asia to, to Europe and in, in even as far as the UK. Um, that's, that's accelerated during the pandemic. Um, so um, we're, we're, we're certainly seeing an increase in the flow of goods by land. Uh, part of that is um, because it's, it, it's, part of it is, is a focus on rail uh, transportation because of its, it, by design, it touches fewer human hands. You're um, so there are challenges that remain, um, a lot, it's a country by country basis in terms of the investments in the Belt and Road. So you see some countries like Kyrgyzstan that are a little less willing, um, they've, they've incurred a lot of debt, but right now there's kind of, uh, they're, um, they're a little recalcitrant in accepting more help from China. Um, so there are some political elements, but overall, I think that it is increasing the flow of goods from, uh, from China to the rest of the world. Okay, excellent. Thank you ever so much, Larry. And thank you to all our panelists for taking those questions so readily and professionally. Can I just ask Jasper, there's a closing slide which just needs to be uh, brought up in bringing this all together and really setting the challenge for the future. So if that can come up, please, Jasper. That will be fantastic. What I would encourage everyone to do that's been listening on this is if there are any issues around education, opportunities that you see for meeting the needs of companies, small businesses, and your own uh, situation with your own CILT country organization, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us. So a very big thank you uh, for attending today. I think we've seen that there's a big issue around investing in human capital that has to carry on, that there are some challenges that lie ahead for investment because of budgets and public sector spending reviews and restrictions. I've got there the four R's around resilience, recovery, reform, and reshaping of the training and development sector. And from what Tanya said, you know, the sooner the better, really, because we are here to respond to what the customer needs rather than forcing them to take uh, rigid and prescriptive courses. Of course, we have to balance that with qualification developments and standards. And then a thing that all of you have shared is around building capability from within the organization, getting hold of the skills that are already embedded in the organization and developing them gives a certain richness. And that's certainly the approach that uh, CILT are adopting in many places around the world, and particularly within the Kazakhstan project. We want to keep this dialogue open. This was the first webinar that we ran uh, focused on this cross-cutting um, issue. And we hope to be able to come back and revisit this, uh, not just because of COVID, but actually just keeping this capacity building conversation alive. Now with that, I'd like to 
hand back to our chair of our Education Standards Committee, Jan. Can you just give us a, a couple of minutes or just on your personal perspective of today and just any closing thoughts? Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, ab absolutely. I, I mean, first of all, thanks to everyone who's participated and, and thanks to you, uh, John, and the team around you who made this possible. Uh, this is not something we've done a lot in the past. And again, I, I just want to emphasize that as a change as well. You know, we, we learn, we adopt, we change, we utilize the tools around us and the technologies that are available to us in new ways and we make best use of them. And that goes, of course, for, for, for learning and education as well. I've been part of the um, Institute uh, management team for um, well, seven years now. And, and it's, it's been a long journey. It's been a very good journey and interesting as well. And I, I think, you know, as the ILT, we have a fantastic opportunity to make our mark and deliver quality uh, learning at a standard. And I absolutely agree with that uh, across the world, uh, whether it's technology enabled or it's uh, partially face to face or it's a blended sort of way of, of doing it. And we, we absolutely have an obligation to do that. We are a charity for the members. Uh, we are a non-profit organization. I think that's important that people understand that, that you know, when, when they spend money uh, with us, it actually goes back to our membership in some shape or form, either in terms of developing new education offerings or membership offerings. So for, for, with, with all of that said, um, I'm, I'm very encouraged to see, you know, the quality of the partners that we have. Um, I'd like to thank all the participants here uh, and the panelists as well uh, on behalf of CLT. Uh, great job and, and some very, very interesting observations that I think we can build on. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Jan. Thank you everybody for giving up an hour and a half of your time. Um, Look out for the future um, advertisement of more, of more webinars on this topic. And remember to, uh, to check out the Facebook page, which is now live for our training providers. Thank you, everybody, and stay safe. Thanks, John. Take care. Thank you, John. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Thank you, Jasper. Mm -hmm.